All right, hi, welcome. I'm Professor Lord. Um, and for at least the first two weeks of the semester, most likely the entire term, um, we'll adopt this format where the theory portion of the course is going to be pre recorded. Um, and then, therefore, we won't meet most likely on the Monday. And then on the Wednesday, you'll have the opportunity on a live um, remote session to ask all the questions you have on the material that's been covered. Um, and I'm, I'm open to any feedback you have on this format, but um, it worked very well last year, and most students found that um, it was actually better to have the theory portion pre-recorded because that allows you to watch it um, at your leisure, not just on the Monday, um, and also allows you to pause me if you're sick of hearing me to watch it multiple times when there's stuff that you don't understand. Um, so hopefully you find that of value, but I'm happy to discuss it um, if, if you prefer to have it done live. Um, so in the readings for, for this week, there isn't really anything that is um, of crucial importance um, to the rest of the course that you'll get tested on. You have a very, very broad introduction to um, to property law. There isn't really any, um, any dense legal principles or case law um, that's covered. Um, you have quite, a, quite an interesting discussion, I think, of indigenous issues, which um, by virtue of the, the structure of this course is mandated by, um, by the people who decide um, what law schools are, are, um, are supposed to teach in Canada. We have to cover common law property. Um, which is all of the arcane rules that we'll learn about this term um, from hundreds of years ago in England, um, which developed mostly in the common law as opposed to statutes, right? As opposed to laws that were passed by legislators, um, mostly developed by courts, um, kind of like tort law um, in a way that was responsive to specific issues that were raised before the courts um, as society kind of evolved. This is not, um, not mentioned in the syllabus, but this is probably not going to be um, your favorite course by virtue of the material. Hopefully I'll make it as fun as it can be, but it's probably not going to be your favorite course. Um, and students often find that it is their hardest course in the first year. Certainly I thought so um, when I was a law student. Um, so try to put as much effort into this class as you can. It's definitely not the one where you want to slack off or um, get behind on your readings um, because the material is very complex and even though it's not always appealing, it's extremely important for you um, to understand it um, properly. As I said, we won't cover indigenous issues all that much. We have um, a class at the end of the term where um, we'll have a brief introduction to Aboriginal title as defined by the Supreme Court of Canada and various precedents. Um, most likely the readings that you have on the syllabus are actually going to change because we're trying to um, make our, um, our indigenous law portion of the course more responsive to um, to a, um, an, a, a, an opportunity that you'll have um, to go to um, Manitou Mounds and, um, and learn about property law there over weekend, I think in March, um, early March, which we very strongly encourage you to attend. Um, so we'll focus mostly, as I said, on, um, on Canadian common law property, which initially developed in, um, in England. First concept that you have in the book is covered is that property is a relationship, right? So um, you'll often hear people say that something is their property, right? Whether they're referring to, um, you know, their house, their book, whatever it is, right? You see already kind of different types of property, right? A house would be um, real uh, property, or, you know, houseless land um, would, would be real property. Um, a book would be what we call personal property, which is everything that is not real property, right? Um, but people generally refer to property as the thing, right? They'll say, you're on my property, or this is my property, um, when referring to a book or a house. Um, and that's actually not the correct legal characterization, because property refers to the relationship between the person and the thing. Right? 
Um, so you'll have, um, to, to put it this way, um, you'll have the relationship um, between me and a book be any other type of property. Um, property is the relationship between me and the book generally best conceptualized, though not fully, as a right, right? The most useful part of the relationship between me and the book is the fact that I own the book, that is the relationship that I have with it, and that's helpful because it helps me um, restrict what various other people can do with it, right? So if people take it away, I can go after it because it is mine, right, because of that relationship that I have with the book, right, and the fact that it is mine is conceptualized as excluding um, other people who do not own it. That is an overly simplified characterization in the sense that um, it is not the only part of the relationship, and so you're mentioned in the book that it is um, or relationships of, of, of rights and obligations, right? Um, so relationship that you have to property, whether it's yours or someone else's, comes not just with rights, such as the ability to go after it if someone takes it away, but also certain obligations. For instance, right, the government might impose various obligations for you to take care of your property properly. Or in some situations, right, you might have obligations to other people for instance, if someone um, gives you their book um, for a, a limited period of time, you might have an obligation to that book, right, to take care of it properly for that period of time, especially if the person is paying you to do that. And therefore, it's best conceptualized, as I said, as right, both rights and obligations and what we refer to as a bundle of rights in the sense that, right, you have multiple relationships in some ways, right? So you have a relationship between me and the book, and it gives me a number of rights. And so that relationship has multiple aspects to it. And it's helpful because first you can have a property relationship that has not all of the rights. So in my example, right, um, where I give my book to someone else for a period of time for money, then they acquire some sort of a relationship to the book, which they paid for, and that's because I gave it to them, and so I don't have it anymore. And so I've redefined both my relationship to the book and the other person's relationship to the book by transferring one of my bundle, uh, one of the rights in my bundle to that other person and I retain some of them, the other person has some of them, and we both have a relationship to the book. So our respective bundle of rights are different, but we both have a relationship that counts here, and so having the bundle of rights is helpful because it can be right, dismembered, it can be given away to other people. Another example might be, right, you might rent a property, again, poor use of the word, um, on my part there, you might rent an apartment, right, a real estate um, property, and by virtue of that, you have a right to occupy it, and you acquire some sort of a relationship to your apartment, which allows you to live in it, but you don't own it. Someone else owns it and also has a relationship to it. Again, you see kind of a dismemberment of these um, various aspects of the property, right? that would otherwise be vested upon the owner. Someone might be both the owner and the occupier of their condo, and therefore they have all the rights in the bundle. So this is a helpful characterization because multiple things count as a property relationship even though you don't have all of the rights in the bundle, first. And second, it's helpful as a characterization because it shows you that the rights that you do have, you are able to transfer to someone else right, either, you know, one by one or multiple aspects of um, what you do have.
There are restrictions, as we said, um, government restrictions, which are mentioned in the book, page two, not best understood as um, a responsibility arising directly out of your property relationship, but it's still helpful to think of the fact that the government has the ability to limit what you can and cannot do, right? And so you do have certain rights by virtue of the fact that you have a property relationship to your stuff, and these rights can be um, pretty extensive. As we'll see, it includes, for instance, the right to exclude all other people from your land. That's quite significant, right? It means that if someone is there, essentially you can sue them, this being a private right of action. You don't get to call the police and send them to jail, right? Um, that would be public law because the criminal law is public law. But what you do get to do is to, um, to sue them for having infringed your property right and potentially get damages. Of course, if they're there for five minutes, you won't have actual damages, but you still have the ability to sue if they don't respect that because you have the ability to exclude them from your property. So quite extensive, and generally you can do whatever you want with it, right? Like your, your house can be um, very messy and the government does not intervene because you own it. Oftentimes your creditors, so the bank you owe money to, also has a right to the house, which you granted in exchange for the money to buy the house. But again, because of that property relationship, the bank doesn't really get to intervene because your house is really messy unless it gets extremely bad. Nonetheless, it is not an absolute relationship. Like all of the rights that we have under the law, it can be limited, and it is limited, right? Even the very important rights that we have, which are protected under the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which are very important, right? That's why they're constitutional in nature. They can trump all sorts of laws that don't respect the Charter, and that's because they're important rights, right? The like, to, like the right to life, liberty, and security of the person under Section 7 of the Charter. Even that is not absolute. It can be limited, right? Section 7 has an internal limit that says, unless it's consistent with, quote unquote, the principles of fundamental justice, and you also have Section 1 of the Charter, which says that most rights under the Charter, not to say all, can be limited as justified in a free and democratic society. And therefore, right, all rights can be limited by the government to achieve various policy objectives that the government wants to achieve. Because frankly, otherwise the government wouldn't be able to do anything because it would always be infringing upon absolute rights. Same thing for property rights, right? Just because you have these very extensive rights to do whatever you want with your stuff does not mean that these rights are absolute. And so the government can pass a law that says you have to take proper care of your land or you cannot mine your land for certain purposes. And that's fully valid, even though if it were not the government, it might be an infringement of your rights. And so these rights are not absolute, not more than any other right um, would be under Canadian law. The government can also subject you to very stringent obligations regarding um, your ability to exercise your right. For instance, right, if you want to mine your property, the government might say that you need to get a very expensive license pursuant to a scheme, and that might make it prohibitively expensive such that you won't do it. That is also allowed. If you have a right to fish, the government can say, well, now no one gets to fish there unless they have a license to do that that they get from us. And that, again, um, is also allowed. There is a discussion of property rights being dynamic, and you see that with my example, right? The government can pass new regulation, and you might say, I wouldn't have bought this stuff if I knew the government was going to regulate me. That does not make a difference, right? You are still subject to regulations, even if they're new, and they regulate property that you have already bought and might not have bought if, um, if you knew that that would be the case. You see kind of broader issues that arise from the readings I gave you on slavery, right? You see that people at one point were property, could be owned by someone else, and that had very significant um, impacts, right? Um, for instance, you 
couldn't really get sued for killing your slave or raping your slave, for instance, and you own their offspring, your kids. And of course, as society evolved, you see very significant evolution of who we conceptualize as subjects and objects of rights. In other words, who we conceptualize as property owners or prospective property owners, people who can own property, and people who are property, right? People who are slaves were essentially the property of other people. They were characterized as such and prevented from, right, doing the thing that property owners could do. They could not own property in their own right. So you see their property law as kind of indirectly, of course, didn't cause slavery, but a way to create and solidify certain power dynamics in society. And you also see an evolution of society, right? The changes in that we see in property law. Another example would be um, married women up until um, a year that would scare you if you Googled it right now, were not either able in a pretty similar way to exercise most of their rights, right? So they couldn't go to the bank and, and open a bank account. They couldn't um, do various things for themselves. And that included owning property. And you see that evolution in the law. There's a discussion of, um, as I said, indigenous law, which is not um, all that important for, um, for our purposes. But one thing that, um, that I wanted to point out is that the general conceptualization of things being owned has very significant consequences pursuant to something we call liberalism, right? So there's a discussion there of the fact that um, indigenous communities just don't share that idea that land can be owned, right? In the sense that you can buy a piece of land and then it's yours and then you do whatever you want with it because land is very important to, um, to indigenous communities. And there isn't really this idea of a private ownership, right? You own things collectively with everyone else. And that has consequences in our legal system by virtue of the fact though that our legal system is arguably um, misadapted for these pre-existing indigenous legal principles, right? It was devised for whatever the people in England were doing at the time and were trying to fit pre-existing indigenous legal principles within that system. For instance, if you want to go to a bank and get money to buy a house, the bank is going to want you to own the thing. And so if that's not something that you can have within your legal order. The bank is going to decline to lend you money because the bank has to know who owns it so it can take ownership, right, or possession of the house if you don't pay down um, your loan. That's related, though, to other principles in society that we might think are, 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 are to be pursued. There's a mention of um, stewardship at page five, right? Basically, when you have a system when people own things, they take care of them to some extent, but not in ways that are not in their interest. For instance, you might take care of your house or your land so it doesn't depreciate in value because it's bad for you, right? Because then when you sell it, you lose your money that you invested into it. However, you don't really have an incentive to say combat climate change because by the time the consequences happen, you'll be dead. And that's indirectly a consequence of the fact that we allow people to own things, right? That we allow people to buy various things that cause climate change, natural resources, right? Land, plants, all that. And then we allow them to have quasi absolute power over what they do with it. And therefore, naturally these people will do what they have an incentive to do, which is to make as much money as possible for themselves and not care about broader social aims such as preventing or combating climate change. In contrast, we can have a system similar to indigenous legal orders where things are just as important as people, where we don't want people to have a monopoly over a thing because the thing is worth something in itself. For instance, we might allow a river that gets polluted to sue, right? And that might be more conducive to 
achieving various social aims that we might have as a society, such as the ones I mentioned earlier. This general idea is what we call liberalism. Liberalism is the idea that when you give people rights, an individual's rights, so not collective rights, for instance, that might be used to combat climate change. When you give individual people rights, and that allows them to pursue what is best for them, such as making a lot of money and trying to be happy in society, that that is the best way to advance the collective happiness of the group, that by people individually seeking to achieve what is best for them, which we protect by giving them rights and preventing other people from, from infringing them, that that is the best way to allow people to, as a society, grow, right? So we'll have economic growth because people are trying to individually make as much money as possible by providing something valuable in the marketplace. But this idea implies that we don't need rights of the group, that we don't need to put the group first because by giving individual right, rights or incentives to pursue, and that is in itself the best way to advance um, the interest of the group. There's also issues, of course, as to um, other social issues that we see in property relationships, right? Um, for instance, there are certain types of property that are fundamentally different, like a house, right? And even though you don't own a house, even though you're a tenant, a house is a very important um, thing in your life because it allows you to be secure and do various other things that right, we think are favorable as a society, such as get a job, contribute, um, interact with other people, and all that. And all that is possible because you have a house. A system where we care about property in a less specific way as a relationship with a thing, is you having a right to be there by virtue of the fact that you pay, and therefore as long as you pay and no further, and having someone else who has the ability to own that, right, and therefore get paid, has consequences as to how we characterize specific objects of property, which might arguably be more usefully protected as, right, not just things which can be appropriated by human beings. Of course, property law more broadly also determines who gets um, and, and, and is protected for their wealth in society, right? Property is a source of wealth and therefore property law protects the respective social standing of people and might even, right, entrench it further um, so it does not change. There's a brief discussion of the Victoria Park case, um, not all that important for our purposes, but it's a very significant case in property law, so you'll want to at least remember what happened there. You have um, a racetrack and then a neighbor builds some sort of a platform so that people see over the land boundary and therefore enjoy whatever the racetrack is selling to its people. That's a problem because the racetrack makes money by selling tickets and then these people right, will either go to that neighboring property and see the, the show for free or even worse, they'll pay the neighbor to get to see that show. And the court finds that that is not something the property owner can sue for because it's not characterized as what we call nuisance, which is a tort, um, and is the way in which you can vindicate as a property owner your ability to have proper use and enjoyment of your property. So if someone interferes with your ability to um, enjoy or use your property, you can, as we will see further in the semester, sue them under nuisance. There are other types of property which we will not look at um, this, this term, such as intellectual property, which is discussed um, briefly in the chapter. And you see certain public policy exceptions. You see things that otherwise would count as property. For instance, body tissues, right? By default, there's no reason to think that it's not personal property, right? It's kind of like a book. It's stuff that's made up of atoms. But then sometimes the courts or the government by passing a law will step in and say, we want this to be different and we therefore want this not to be something that can count as property and be appropriated by people. 
for what we call um, for what we call public policy reasons, right? So the government generally has some uh, objective having to do with what it thinks is best for society. It's what we call public policy and therefore is going to intervene. And the courts can invoke something similar. So they can say that it is just not appropriate or not in the best interest of people for these things to be owned. And you have discussion of the Saulnier case, which is also a significant case um, in Canada. Basically, you have someone who has what we call a license. What is a license, you ask? It's something that we'll learn about, which is not part of the bundle of rights. And so it is not a property relationship. In other words, if you are the property owner and you give someone else what we call a license, you've given them a right of some sort, what we call a private right. And so you've given someone a right ostensibly by virtue of a contract. And then that person has the right by virtue of that. And therefore, if you infringe upon it, so if you stop respecting your obligations, they can sue you. They can sue you under the contract in a court of law. That is not a property relationship. It, it's a right, essentially, right? A, a right that you've given someone else. Therefore, as a property owner, you have, again, the bundle of rights, right? You have the ability to use your property. You have the ability to occupy it. You have the ability to give the, the, the ability to someone else to occupy it for money, right? You can dismember your right, as we said, in various ways. That does not include what you would give to someone as a license, which is a right to be there generally for a limited period of time in a way that is revocable. Because that is not a property relationship, because it's not significant enough, it just doesn't count. And so the property owner, your property relationship has not changed. You've given something that's more akin to a contractual right to someone else. A license, as I said, is a right to do something that would other to, to do something, sorry, that would otherwise be illegal. For instance, if you have a concert hall and you allow people in to see a show, generally you do that because they give you money. That's why you've given them a license. That is a license. So your, your movie ticket or your concert ticket is a license because it gives you the right to do something that would otherwise be illegal, namely enter upon someone else's property. You couldn't be in the concert hall if you were not invited there by virtue of that ticket you got um, by paying money. That's a license. Generally, it's limited in time, right? So for instance, in your concert is only, um, your concert ticket is only valid for the period that's provided for on it. And it is revocable if it's not limited in time. So people might say, I grant you a right to come onto my property to take the apples from the tree, or that's actually a poor example, um, but to enter onto the property to do anything. And as a result of that, um, you gain that ability. If it's not time limited generally, it's revocable and that's why it counts as a license. So the person can change their mind and then remove that right from you. Why did I say it's a bad example? Um, it's a bad example because if you're taking apples, it would be something we call a profit de plongerer, which is different, which is the ability to enter onto someone else's property to take something. So in my example, the ability to enter onto your neighbor's land, which they give you, might be a license. But if you're going there for a specific purpose to take stuff, generally of value, generally natural resources, that is what we call a profit upon it. So in the Saulnier case, you have a license, which is um, a right to fish, which does not usually count as property. The case does not change that. That's the important part. Um, it, it characterizes it as property pursuant to the Bankruptcy Act, which is some law, 
which has its own definition of property, which you can have. So the government passes a law, as it always does, right? calls it the Bankruptcy and Insolvency Act to regulate what happens when people don't have the money to pay to their debt. Right? That's insolvency. And then if they declare bankruptcy, that's bankruptcy. Bankruptcy and Insolvency Act has a definition. You'll get used to laws, right? They have a bunch of definitions at the beginning. Usually that's the second section. The first is usually the title of the act. So you have in that example, right, section two of the Bankruptcy Act, which is the definitions, which provides for a definition of property. And then it's no longer the common law property definition that we've had, which was developed by the courts from England and then Canada for the past 200 years, because you have a statutory definition. The statute prevails. The government gets to define property however it wants, right? The judges do it when no one did, but the government has the ability to change that if it's not happy with the common law. So the government provides for a definition, then that definition prevails. And as we'll see for the reasons that are mentioned in the case, that specific statutory definition would include the license, the right to fish in that example. But that does not mean that under the common law property rules that we'll learn for the entire semester, that changes the characterization of a license, which is not, again, a property right. Interestingly, it's not exactly a license that can be characterized as such in that case because you do not have the discretion that I mentioned. As I said, a license is usually either for a period of time or revocable at will. So either you get the ability to go there for the concert one night between 8 and 10 in the evening, or if it's not time limited, it's usually revocable. If I give you a right to come onto my property, period, for it to be a license, it's revocable, which means I can wake up tomorrow and say, I'm sick of you, I don't want you on my property anymore, and I therefore revoke your license. This is technically how the license worked in that case. It was given by the Crown, so the Crown says now you have a right to get the fish. Because it's a license, the Crown can change its mind. Interestingly, there, the Crown, by historical practice, does not happen to change its mind. In other words, when it gives someone the right to fish, even though it has the power to revoke it, does not revoke it, does not have, quote unquote, unfettered discretion, to use the proper words used in the case. Um, and therefore, it's not really a license. It still counts as one because the Crown has that legal ability. But as characterized, it would not meet the default definition that I've just given you. And that's the very reason why, for instance, you're able to sell your license to fish or mortgage it, right, borrow against it. These are all things you can do with, again, your property relationship by dismembering it. You have a property right, you own the book, you get to sell it to someone else and therefore transfer, in that case, your entire property right, your entire bundle there, to someone else. You also get to mortgage it. You get to give a right to the bank, this partial transfer of your rights, right, not the entire thing, a right to the bank, one of your rights, to take it if you don't pay your loan. It's again by virtue of your property relationship. You can dismember it, you have the whole thing, you give a part of it to the bank, and what the bank does in exchange is give you money. And then as long as you pay, the bank doesn't exercise its right. Well, in the, in the example I gave you, right, the, the, the fishing license is, in, in the example in the case, sorry, rather, um, the, the license to fish has value to other people in the bank willing to buy it or mortgage it precisely because it can't be canceled, right? If it were a traditional license, if the crown had the habit of canceling your right to fish whenever it wanted, it wouldn't have much value, right? People wouldn't pay half a million dollars, as is the case in the case. Um, for a right that is likely to be canceled tomorrow for any or no reason at all. So again, the case finds that that counts as, um, as property under the definition of the Bankruptcy and Insolvency Act, the statutory interpretation, so the government there has first passed a law that has a definition that says what property is. So then the court has to respect that, engage in statutory interpretation, interpret the statute, namely the Bankruptcy and Insolvency Act, 
and therefore the definition that provides that it provides for what counts as property. And the courts adopt what we call a purposive interpretation, which is an interpretation that is consistent with the purpose of the act. So, for example, right, you have um, the definition, which is on the first page of the case, um, whatever that is, page 27, definition of property. Doesn't mention a license. So then the court has to interpret it and decide whether or not a license counts under that definition. So the court looks at the definition. It has 20 things in there. It appears that the intention of the government was to have a broad definition. That's why it listed 20 things in there, including things that are not traditionally considered property under common law property rules. License isn't listed in there, but other stuff. And therefore, it appears that the government has, again, the intent to have a broad interpretation of property. And the court is going to respect that by including a license in that definition, even though it does not traditionally count as property. And second, in, in that purposive interpretation exercise, the court is going to look at the general legislative scheme. The court's going to say, it appears from the law that the goal of the government was to include, again, all of the stuff in there. Because we see from the other provisions of the statute, the Bankruptcy and Insolvency Act, and from, say, the debates of the people when they passed the law, when they said what their actual intent was, it appears that their intent was to have as much stuff as possible be claimable by the trustee in bankruptcy who administers the bankruptcy. And that objective, as found there, is best met by having a broad definition of property. I just want to mention one thing briefly in closing, which is intellectual property, which is something that, as I said earlier, we will not look at. And it's actually a misleading term because um, it's not directly property, and it's, that's why it's an entirely different area of law. You don't actually own your ideas, and these things don't count as common law property precisely because of that. So an idea is not uh, property, right, is not something that can be subject to a property relationship in the same way as a book because it's intangible for various other reasons. So intellectual property creates this ability to own ideas, but it's misleading because it's not really property law, and because it's not really by virtue of the fact that it's property. It's by virtue of the fact that the government passed a bunch of laws that allows you to own ideas. And on top of that, it's misleading because you don't actually own ideas. But the government passes a law, for instance, the Copyright Act, that says your Creation, once laid down, is protected. So your idea is not protected, but once you write a book, we have what we call fixation. All that is not important for our purposes. Don't note it down. So fixation in, onto the book, and then you have an intellectual property right upon the book. So all that is misleading because you never own the idea. You own the idea as expressed in the book. And that's copyright. Copyright is your right to the book when you wrote it down, when you put your ideas and you fixated them onto the medium. And then it gives you various rights under the statute. So the Copyright Act says, right, that allows you to sell it, that allows you to prevent people from having access to it unless they pay you for it, it allows you to prevent people from copying it, hence why it's called copyright, etc. But again, these are not things that traditionally fall under the common law property rules that we'll see this semester. In fact, they don't. And they're not really property law because they're this separate area of law that we call intellectual property. Same thing for a patent. A patent is when you invent something, you have a right to a government sanctioned monopoly to commercialize it by virtue of, again, a law that the government passed, which we call the Patent Act. And once you invent something, for instance, you invent a snowmobile, um, which is the example I've always used. People in my, my intellectual property course were probably very sick of snowmobiles. But say you invent that, right, then you do all sorts of things that the statute says you have to do. You, you put down the plan, you hire all sorts of expensive people to make your submission to the government. The government looks at it, decides it's actually new, which is one of the criteria under the statute, and then the government issues you a patent, which is a right. It's 
intangible property in the sense that you again indirectly own an idea that you have, but you don't really. You own the invention which you had the idea for. And then by virtue of the statute you have various rights, namely a monopoly. So you get to sell your snowmobile for the first 20 years and you don't have competitors, which is good because then you'll charge more for it, you'll make money and that allows you to right, have the, the will to invent it in the first place because you want to make all that money for 20 years without competitors. And you also have, right, by a corollary of that, the ability to sue people if they try um, to market something that's substantially similar to your invention. So you see analogies there with property, right, but again these are things that fall under another area of the law that we will not cover this term.